This is Michael Cowan, and welcome to Trial Lawyer Nation. You need to show people the worst possible harm that that negligence could have caused, because that's what the case is about. What I'm asking you to do is to focus on what you can control, because that's where the power lies. The Dalai Lama uh, has a saying that in the face of anger, justice evaporates. If you can't focus group it, you have to be very, very critical of your process. The facts aren't good. You can't create a miracle. We can agree to disagree and be zealous advocates for our clients. Quit worrying about looking perfect. You're not going to. That'll come in pack but you can still be an effective litigator. Welcome to the award-winning podcast, Trial Lawyer Nation, your source to win bigger verdicts, get more cases, and manage your law firm. And now, here's your host, noteworthy author, sought-after speaker, and renowned trial lawyer, Michael Cowan. Today on Trial Lawyer Nation, I'm joined by my partner, Sonia Rodriguez, and we have had a lot of questions coming in about how to keep pushing cases uh, and overcome defense delay tactics uh, during this time of the coronavirus when we're all working from home. Uh, So how are you doing today, Sonia? I'm good. Great, Michael. It's good to see you. So have you run into this? (laughs) As you know, I have. Um, Yeah, I think that there were a few weeks of just initial uncertainty by defense counsel uh, as to how the uh, things would work. And so it, there has been, you know, some initial um, reluctance to get things done and get things moving. Uh, I think that's loosening up the longer uh, this is going on now. So what are some things you have done? Uh, and I've seen the same thing, you know, defense lawyers saying, well, I need to be there. I need to see the witness in the eye. I need to sit next to my, my uh, client to make him or her feel better. What are some things you've done to push past that resistance? Well, I think that one of the realities is that um, we've got to keep pushing our cases. I mean, the wheels of justice don't come to a complete halt. And we have a duty to our clients to keep the case uh, moving. Even if the defense wants to delay, um, I think we've got to be creative. One thing that I've done... Uh, that has helped kind of ease the road for getting some work done on cases and taking depositions and moving forward with mediations, despite counsel, you know, initially not wanting to do that, is um, setting out a very clear, transparent proposal for the technology that we're going to use. I know you've circulated with Jacob uh, a protocol for Zoom depositions, and we've got a protocol for Zoom mediations if a mediator doesn't already have one. And so I think there is a comfort level um, that you're kind of creating when you're transparent with how things can work. And um, it, it kind of eases the uncertainty of like, how, how can it be done that some defense counsel are having? Yeah, and I think that, you know, we've had to offer to do practice sessions with people so they become comfortable with the technology. Uh, and for the people that are acting in good faith, that seems to have worked well. Uh, the issue is there are some people, especially on our bigger cases, that maybe aren't so much acting in good faith and really are trying to take advantage of the situation to delay a case. What have you done in those circumstances to try to, to force someone's hand? Well, unfortunately, you're always going to deal with people who are going to try to uh, drag the case out, um, try to obstruct your ability to do discovery during this time. So uh, I've not been shy about filing motions to compel depositions and laying out for the court, again, all of the technology available to do these depositions remotely. Um, one of the ironies is you've got defense counsel arguing that they can't participate in a deposition by Zoom, but at least here in Bear County where we practice uh, and through most of the courts in Texas, they're conducting their tel- their remote hearings by Zoom. So it's kind of hard for them to go to the court and suggest that Zoom is into a proper method for taking a deposition when the hearing is being heard, you know, via Zoom. Yeah, and that's been one of the uh, the lucky things about Texas is our courts were pretty good early on on uh, 
you know, it was only a few weeks before we started actually doing hearings by Zoom and the courts just statewide adopted Zoom as a technology. So, you know, for depositions, there's other platforms that will work just as well. There's Google Hangouts, there's Microsoft Teams, there's WebEx, there's GoToMeeting. I'm sure there's other things that could work for a deposition. I probably wouldn't use Teams for a deposition because I'd be worried about giving access accidentally to some firm stuff. But there are lots of platforms available, but we've really pushed Zoom for two reasons. One, our courts had adopted Zoom. So like you said, it's hard to go to a Zoom hearing and say Zoom's not good enough when the judge is already familiar with it and using it. The other thing is I found that Zoom just has a better sound and video quality, especially when you have a less than perfect connection. Whenever we did depots by WebEx or GoToMeeting in the past, uh, we would have to make sure people used the phone for sound because their their computer audio was just sketchy. And the, they may have fixed that issue, but I just found that Zoom was a little more reliable. It's, it's also so um, user-friendly. Uh, we had a Zoom hearing in Brownsville uh, last week, and I was surprised to see the client appeared for the hearing, which he has every right to do and would have every right to do. Um, but it's kind of nice to see, you know, his face there, knowing that he was able to maneuver the technology on his own without any instruction from us, uh, just to, to attend the hearing in his case. It's nice. Yeah, and one thing that we did, and I have to give credit, Michael Watts, uh, who's a plaintiff's lawyer out of Texas, who is one of our first early guests on this podcast, along with the defense lawyer, like Monty English, kind of started the ball rolling in Corpus Christi, Texas, by getting an order, by convincing the judges uh, to enter like an administrative order for their county saying that, you know, depots could have happened by Zoom, hearings could happen by Zoom, mediations could happen by Zoom. Uh, And we have pushed, I know that I have called judges that I know and and pushed them and pushed them. And, you know, as long as, you know, under the ethical rules, it would be totally improper to call a judge and say, hey, I have this one case that you're the judge on. And in that case, they're not giving depots and I want you to do something. That would be ex parte. But when we're talking about what the court rules are for cases in general, there is nothing wrong with talking to judges and saying, judge, here is an issue across all cases. Here is a solution. And, you know, I'm asking you as a member of the bar and a member of the public to, you know, improve the administration of justice by allowing remote depositions uh, and by doing remote hearings if you have a court that's not already doing remote hearings. And I think the more people push. And if you find friendly people on the other side of the docket, because there are defense lawyers that have realized they need to bill hours. And without depositions and hearings, there's only so many hours they can bill. uh, They want to keep things moving too. Uh, The more we can get people pressing our courts to to find ways to move things along, find ways to have Zoom hearings, find ways to require parties to do remote uh, depositions, uh, the better off we're all going to be. You know, I was really um, pleasantly surprised. We did, uh, I did a mediation, I participated in a mediation uh, a few weeks ago that initially uh, the defense counsel um, wanted to cancel and postpone until there was some certainty on whether we could do it in person. And the reason was that he had, you know, there were going to be multiple carriers there. There were going to be multiple representatives of of the uh defendant there. And so he had seven folks that he had to maneuver uh, on his end. And I had me and my client. But um, I was really pleasantly surprised at the mediator's ability to manage all the participants in the separate rooms. Um, But it took some convincing of the defense lawyer and uh, getting him together with the mediator uh, about how it would work. And, you know, the case settled for a really good result. Um, And so if we hadn't just kind of eased people's concerns, uh, that case probably would still be sitting on my docket. And so I think that, um, you know, there's a a little bit of an uncertainty in it. Um, And I think lawyers just have a tendency of wanting to be in control and wanting to know all the things. And so if we can just accept that we're not going to know all the things right now, but um, 
uh, keep pushing forward, I think we can still be productive. And I think that's true for judges too, because the judges don't have all the answers yet. Um, but we can't let things come to a halt. Yeah, I've kind of got two thoughts on mediation. One, I find it's rare that someone that has the true power and authority to make decisions is at a mediation, no matter what people say. Because I don't know how many times I've heard of mediation, well, we got to get on the phone to see if we can get any more money. I mean, I hear that every time. Because uh, they just send somebody with the illusion of a number, but the fact is they've already had a round table. They've given the person, you know, try to settle it for this amount or less, and that's authority you have. That person typically does not have the authority to change the reserves or change what they're going to pay on the case. And so I think just skipping the step and having that person who would otherwise be on the phone available by Zoom. Well, uh, the irony is, Michael, at that mediation, uh, it didn't settle the day of the mediation because the person who had the authority <laughs> wasn't there. So yeah. it, it settled three weeks later. But, but he wouldn't um, have been there if we did it in person either. That's right. That's right. But that, that goes to the importance of going through the process anyway, um, because you, you uh, have the mediator's input and the mediator's ear and attention for that time. And, and um, you know, to the extent that the case should re, should be resolved, it, you know, you can't just let it sit there, kick the can down the road. I think that lawyers who think that they're going to just kick the can down the road are going to find um, that it's going to impact their business and their clients' cases and their clients' access to justice. So, uh, you know, we've got to be creative and, and keep pushing our cases forward. And really now more than ever, so many of our clients have lost their jobs. Uh, and we obviously don't want to settle things cheap because they're in economic duress, although they may not, they may give us no choice. It's their case. But, you know, if there's a way to get fair value on their cases while they need the money, it's in their best interest. And then it's in our firm's interest. You know, we've been we've been lucky so far and blessed that we have not suffered any economic downturn uh, from this pandemic. Um, I continue to be worried about future stuff, which we can talk about. But as far as the the present, you know, March and April have been fine. Uh, and I haven't seen the numbers any different. The, the percentage of cases settling or the numbers that were being offered really changing at these Zoom mediations. I have not found that we've had any adverse uh, consequence from doing it by Zoom. No, I, I mean, I agree. I was surprised. I was thinking that um, the case values would be impacted based on participation by Zoom, um, but I haven't seen it either. Now, in doing Zoom depositions, let's talk about preparing a client for deposition. You know, a lot of people are worried that, oh, well, I'm not going to be able to sit next to my client. Well, you're not unless you're kicking a client under the table or passing notes or making faces. You know, I don't know really they're kind of on their own when they're testifying other than your objections. Uh, I think it's really a question of preparing them. How, how is it different to prepare someone by zoom? Well, I think that, you know, if you're the kind of person who likes to sit across the table and, and hold your client's hand as you're prepping them for, a, you know, an important deposition, you know, there's going to be a loss of that intimacy, a loss of that, you know, uh, uh, relationship, feel for the prep deposition prep but uh, the other challenge is not all of our clients have access to technology the way we do and their homes are not set up in a way to have a private room for them to sit in for you know four hours or three hours however long their deposition is going to take um, so there are some technological challenges I think that we face uh, in preparing them for their deposition I think um, one of the folks who wrote in with a question about is it ethical to prepare your deposition, your client for a deposition and not in person? I mean, I don't think that there is any kind of ethical prohibition of preparing your client for a deposition by Zoom. I think what you have to do as a lawyer is make sure that your client is prepared for their deposition and that there's a comfort level. And I think that can be achieved by Zoom as long as your client has the technology they need to be able to interface with you and they have the privacy they need in their home to do that. Um, I think there's some creative ways to, to, to do that. I mean, 
You can also, if you, I mean, depending on what your jurisdiction is telling you about uh, meetings, you could sit six feet away from somebody with a mask and prepare them for the deposition too. I mean, if that were, if that's depending on the rules of where you are. Yeah. Yeah. Depending on the rules of where you are. I, I would, you know, personally discourage that because I, I just want to minimize uh, getting sick. I know we had a client that just couldn't get it done. I mean, he just, we bought a tablet for him. He just could not figure it out. <laughs> and on that one case, we, you know, the associate actually, and, I, and, I, and I'll give him credit. The lawyer at our firm wanted to find a way to keep the case going, wanted to bring the client in, sit with them and do the deposition from our office where we have good Wi-Fi and good webcams. And I said, no. Uh, you know, in that case, that it was a health and safety issue. The guy couldn't figure it out. We did our best, and that depot is going to have to wait. You know, the fact yeah. is, if we can keep 95% of our cases moving, uh, and, you know, but we have, you know, you have to think of creative ways, and we have spent, and they're cheap. We bought a couple of tablets for the, you know, we have the client sign something by DocuSign agreeing that, you know, if, if I don't give the tablet back, you're going to take the cost of it out of my settlement at the end. Uh, and we send them the tablet. Um, so that they can do it from home and it's got like a little stand so that it stands up and they're not having to hold this. At first we had clients trying to give a depot while they're holding the phone. Yeah. You know, that doesn't work very well for a long period of time. The, uh, but it's really important to practice with them and, and realize that they don't necessarily, because you're doing it over the phone or you're doing it through zoom, that they may not assume that it is serious. I think Mallory had one early on with the clients actually walking around, went to the store during the depot. <laughs> uh, and so I think, you know, it's, it's just really important that, that practice with the client, with the technology. So you're not only doing the regular depot prep, but you're also doing the technology. You know, the, and, you know, people were asking me first, well, what about the cost? What about the cost of buying the technology? But when you think of a cost of traveling, unless right. you have a, a case, that's uh, a practice that's purely within one city. When you look at what we spend traveling from place to place to do these depots, to do these depot preps, we're actually, even if we had to buy a client, like a like a tablet for every case, uh, we would probably end up saving money in the long run for all the travel expenses that we're cutting out. You know, I think one of the, uh, one of the big concerns that lawyers have um, about the depositions by Zoom is, you know, in, in Texas, you can uh, recess the deposition. You can take a break and, you know, you have an opportunity to, to confer with your witness between the deposition breaks during, you know, during the deposition. And um, I think that lawyers were concerned, like, they're not going to be able to do that. They Can they communicate with their client during a break? You know, and so I've taken two depositions since we've been working from home and defense counsel was able, both of them were able to take a, you know, during the break in the deposition, we went an hour and then we would take a break and the witness would leave their little room and the defense counsel would leave their little room and I'm sure conferred. Um, but it didn't seem to inhibit uh, their ability to talk to their client. I'm sure they're talking to them by phone, but I mean, I didn't see anything that I thought was inappropriate, and I certainly didn't see anything that inhibited uh, their ability to represent their client in the deposition. And so, that's another thing that we can do is just it's part of the practice. Just tell your client, like when we take a break and, you know, if I take a, take a break to go to the bathroom, mute your computer, mute your tablet, go to another room and I will call or text you from the phone. Uh, you right. Obviously, you can't be texting during the deposition while they're being questioned. But on right. breaks, you can still talk to each other. And, and just if you practice, that's the big thing. You practice, you make arrangements for it. Uh, the one thing we have learned is Zoom does have a, a default ability to send private messages, uh, which you, if you have a defense counsel you're worried may try to plant answers to the witness or use that. There is a way to turn it off uh, when whoever's hosting it. We prefer to host ourselves. But if you have a court reporter hosting, you need to make sure they turn off the ability to send private messages during the deposition, or if not, someone could be feeding answers or giving coaching during the question and answer. You know, I've had um, lawyers challenge me on this whole issue and say, well, what if the lawyer is texting the, the witness during the deposition and telling them how to answer? What if they're, you know, there's somebody holding up 
answers on the other side of the Zoom camera. You know, and the reality is that if, if a lawyer is going to do something unethical by Zoom, that's probably the same kind of lawyer that was going to do something unethical in right. a real life deposition. So, um, you know, I don't think we can control for everything. Um, we've all taken an oath. Um, and so I think that uh, you can't you can't control that kind of thing. I mean, the witness is under oath. So technically you could ask them, you know, is your lawyer signaling you to answer? And that's no different, though, than if you were in a live deposition and had a lawyer kicking the witness under the table. Yeah. And you can see people's eyes in a Zoom depot. It's on video. So you can at least it's not like the old telephone depots where you really had to worry about that. Uh, right. So you really can see. Uh, you know, if someone keeps looking down and then answering the question or looking somewhere else and answering a question, just ask them. And even if they lie, if you end up playing that depot to the jury, they're going to see it. Each year, the law firm of Callan Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide on trucking and company vehicle cases. If you have a case involving death or catastrophic injuries and would like to partner with our firm, please contact us. We have experience finding potential defendants that other firms miss, and we've added millions of dollars to cases by finding these sources of recovery. If you have a catastrophic injury or death case where the policy limits appear to be insufficient, give us a call. If we can find another defendant, we can partner on the case. And if we can't, then we won't ask for any of the fees. You can reach Delisi Friday by calling 210-941-1301 or send an email to podcast at triallawyernation.com. She will coordinate a time for Michael Cowan to speak with you in person or by phone to discuss the case in detail. And now back to the show. You know, and the ability to use exhibits in depositions, I think, takes practice. I think it's a great idea to practice with your exhibits, um, even visit with your court reporter in advance, because the court reporting services are really trying hard to stay busy during this time. And they are probably steps ahead of the law firms. I was you know, surprised to hear from the um, court reporter this week in the deposition I took uh, day before yesterday uh, that she can mark exhibits on the fly, whereas I was thinking I had to pre-mark all of my exhibits and send them to the witness in advance. Um, she said that she was able to pre-mark, I mean, mark them as we were going. Um, so that was kind of nice uh, to know that we don't have to give up our, our deposition strategy in advance. Uh, but that is something that you've got to work out with your court reporter in advance. And I think it also depends on what the exhibits are, because I know uh, partner Mallory had a depot where the, you know, she, she could display the portion of the exhibit she wanted through the Zoom share screen feature. Mm -hmm. And but the witness kept insisting he had to see another part of the document to answer the question. And these are like trucking logs and stuff where they did not need to do that. But okay. to try to avoid when she had him to try to avoid asking, answering the question. You know, she kept trying to get, well, scroll here, we'll scroll here. Why well, can't see this? I can't see that. Just to try to throw her off. So yeah. there may be, you know, look at your documents. There may be situations where you're going to be better off, you know, printing them and overnighting them to the witness. There may be situations where you're better off just, uh, you know, displaying them electronically and then sending them to the court reporter at the end. If you do send them to the witness, you know, I would probably put them in a weird order. Uh, I would probably throw in things I wasn't going to use. And if I had the stuff, it depends on how you're doing working from home. If I could put them in a notebook with tabs to make it easier to flip from exhibit to exhibit, I'd do that. Right. And that's what I did with uh, the one this week. Um, I was I learned from Mallory's experience and um, decided to make sure that the witness had hard copies of the exhibits in front of him. So uh, we we uh, we were able to email them. And I offered to just, you know, ship them to the witness, but defense counsel um, ensured that he had them in front of him. So that was good. Yeah. If you have a corporate defendant, they're probably going to have access to a printer and all that stuff. Just some of our, let's say a truck driver or someone that owns one of these little bitty trucking companies may not have the same technology uh, to be able to get a PDF and print it and have it right. in front of her. Right. We, I was pleasantly surprised we issued a subpoena for a Zoom deposition of uh, an eyeball witness um, last week. And um, the process server was able to serve the witness with my Zoom deposition subpoena. And uh, as terrified that the witness wasn't going to know 
you know, what to do, how to maneuver the technology. So I asked the process server to give the witness my phone number. And um, sure enough, immediately after being served with the subpoena, the witness calls me on my mobile. And uh, I walked the witness through what, you know, I thought was gonna be a very complicated concept. And she said, um, no, my kids are using Zoom for their school. So we have it set up at our house already. And so, you know, people are being exposed to Zoom and, and remote learning and remote technology all over. And so I think it's going to be a little easier um, as things go forward and there's a comfort level there. Yeah, we even have J Jimmy Kimmel live from home via Zoom every night on TV. I mean, people people are yeah. doing that. And uh, yeah, I know my kids are both doing Zoom classes today. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that, um, you know, I thought it was going to be impossible to help this witness understand what to do. And she was like, no, I've got it. We're I'm familiar with it. We're good. Yeah. So. But you also got a chance to talk to the witness that you may not have otherwise <laughs> been able to talk to. That's true. That's true. In that case. Uh, and she was a pretty important witness. So. Yeah. And, you know, we don't yet know about how enforceable a Zoom subpoena would be with an uncooperative witness. But then again, you know, if we can get 90 percent. Or 85 percent it's better than zero so let's just push through the best we can this isn't going to last forever whatever slips through the cracks we'll clean up later right. but just keep pushing 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 and you know it really is in everyone's interest to keep the practice of law going on both sides because frankly you know we've got our inventory cases they're worth what they're worth and we're going to get paid on them one one day or another and we may be paid later but we're going to push them and we're not going to settle them cheap uh, but a defense lawyer, if they go three or four months without billing, they may not be able to survive. And I think the re the important thing too, Michael, is that we have a duty to our clients to move their cases and to represent them earnestly. And so when your client calls you and says, what is going to happen now? What's happening with my case? What's happening with my trial date? You know, we can't, if we're honest with them, we can't predict what's going to happen with their trial date whether they will get their jury trial in June. Um, but what we can tell them if we're doing things right is that I am working on your case. I am not stopping. I'm continuing to take depositions. We are setting here motions for hearing. Um, so the whole idea that, uh, you know, your client trusts you and is relying on you to represent them, you've got to, make sure that you're doing that. And, and, you know, kind of like Sari Delamont says, you know, I've got this and I've got you, you know, yep. there are certain parts of the, there are certain parts of uh, the practice that we can't control and that we don't know, but what we can control and what we do know is that I can keep working on my cases and I can keep pushing on my cases and I can keep representing my client earnestly. Yeah, and jury trials, are, I, I think to me, that's the biggest unknown, because I don't think that we're going to have jury trials by Zoom. I don't think I, I could be wrong. I, I think, it, you know, having 12 people Zoom in for a trial, giving an opening by Zoom, you know, hoping they're all paying attention and not, you know, I mean, it's hard enough to get a jury to pay attention eight hours a day when they're in a courtroom. Uh, I, I think doing a jury trial by Zoom is, unless this thing just drags on forever, is very, very unlikely. So, you know, there's, I've heard all kinds of questions about when are we going to have trials again? What's it going to be like when we have trials again? And my biggest answer is we have a given amount of energy to spend every day. And that's all the energy we're going to have. I mean, there's just, you can, you know, you cheat and take, you know, drink lots of coffee, but you're going to pay it back later. Uh, you, there's just only so much energy you have. You can spend that energy on positive things, moving forward on things you can control. Or you can waste that energy worrying about things that are totally outside your control. And it doesn't mean that you don't think about those things, but you can't let it suck up all your energy and then drain you where you can't get anything done. So I don't know when I'm going to try another case. I might mean, have this year. This was a beautiful year. I had it so planned out. You know, I got my first verdict in January. We had a big brain injury case with a drunk driver that I thought I could get a huge verdict on in April that was going to go. You and I had a big, big case that, you know, we're still hoping against hope is going to go on June 15th. 
Um, but, you know, who knows whether it will or not. You know, we, we just had a series of big cases set for trial that were going to be fun, that we're going to have the opportunity to have big hits. Uh, and, you know, it's being taken away from me. And that's just life. And I, I can either mope about it and get nothing done and fall in the hole, or I can work on the things I can control and keep our practice improving and keep our cases moving forward. And, I, and I'm choosing, and it's a choice. I am choosing to spend my limited energy on the positive things that are within my control. And I think too, Michael, it's important to to remember that as trial lawyers, we're wired to fly by the seat of our pants and be creative and handle and tackle things that come up unexpectedly. And so this is no different. And we just got to keep pushing. I was talking to a 45-year lawyer uh, last week, and he was frustrated with this idea of having to do things by Zoom because what if the audio goes out? Or what if you lose a picture? Or what if the, the picture is glitchy? And, you know, I pointed out how different is that than your Elmo going out on you in the middle of a depot? I mean, you pick up and you move on. I mean... If your technology isn't working in the depot or your PowerPoint didn't transfer onto your laptop correctly or something, as trial lawyers, we pick up and move on and keep going. Um, so what ifs are not an excuse for not working up your file? And the fact is, if something goes wrong, you take a break and you fix it and you go back and you start again. It's okay. not It's right. not a big deal. And, and Just getting and over that. And we've had to we've had to realize that, you know, uh, I would love my depositions to be seamless and pretty and, and all very succinct. But, you know, the reality is if the witness can't see my share screen and I have to share screen three times and say, can you see it now? No. Can you see it now? No. <laughs> you know, we just have to work through that until he can see it. And we'll edit that out later. Exactly. The, the jury's not going to see our struggle. <laughs> They're going to see the part that worked. And that's what I told. What's what I told Mallory on the, you know, the witnesses playing the games. Just go through the game, spend as much time as it needs, let them, and then go get your question and answer once they finish doing that. And then at trial, we would just play the, the clear questions and answers and leave all the games out. Right. Unless right. it's really clear that they're playing games such that the jury would be pissed off at them. But generally, you know, f find a way to use it uh, to your advantage. And remember, we can edit out all the technical difficulties. Right, right. Just don't forget to go back and ask the question that you'd ask during the technical difficulty. Exactly. That's the thing. Just remember, you know, you, you're you're making a, a record and, and if you have a technical difficulty, you got to fix the record. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I found it to be really refreshing um, that at least in our jurisdiction, the courts are making a commitment to keep the courthouse open and um, that uh, most of the defense lawyers at this point now are realizing they can't just uh, put their cases on pause for three weeks because it's going to hit their bottom line. Um, so we're seeing a flurry of deposition notices now. And, you know, I think now the, the issue is going to shift to, you know, can we maintain a, a busy trial docket uh, and keep our sanity working from home and having kids and, you know, right. Uh, and I found that judges are having very little patience for delay tactics right now, too. I think so, too. I mean, the reality is that those judges and their clerks and their staff have all, you know, uh, committed to keeping the courthouse open. And uh, they are not having a lot of patience for lawyers who are coming to the court and suggesting that they can't participate by Zoom or they can't do a deposition remotely when they've got uh, court staff working remotely. Yep. So. And so I have heard all different things about how this experience, this collective societal experience we're having is going to affect juries. I've had defense lawyers saying that juries aren't going to care about what your client went through because they just went through you know, all this other stuff and all these other people have died and they didn't get paid. Nick Rowley says juries are going to be even better and he'll tell you why. Uh, David Ball says nobody has any clue what, what it's going to be. There is no good data, and we're just going to have to write it out. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, you know, I think that I like David's reality, you know, realistic answer. You know, we don't know. 
I mean, there's just no way to know. But I think it's going to depend really heavily on the economic um, situation when the juries are coming back. I mean, if if people have been out of work for all of this time um, and uh, your jury pool is uh, in a position where they don't want to be there, really, really can't be there because of their economic situation. Um, I don't think it'll it'll be good for us for for the outcome. Um, literally keeping jurors hostage. But I mean, I think if um, the if the economy can stabilize and juries feel this sense of community and we've made it through, or this is our civic duty to, to do it. I think there is a, I think there is a universe where jurors are going to feel like this is, you know, camaraderie or civic duty. Uh, the isolation of it is pretty frustrating. So the idea that you're participating in something communally, I think could rally a jury. Yeah, I think once we get past, you know, I don't want to try a case with a juror that feels like we're endangering them yeah. by having them there around other people. Once we get past that, I think Americans have incredibly short memory. I remember being told after 9-11, nothing's ever going to be the same. Juries are never going to give money because we've gone through this horror as a society. Uh, and within you know, six months a year, jurors were back to doing what they were doing. Uh, after the 2008, 2009 financial collapse, so it was terrible. This is going to change jurors forever. Uh, you know, I've seen slow trends where actually juries have been getting better over the last so many years. Uh, but I don't think it's reactions to one event just seem to maybe have something very temporary, but we get back to regress to the mean. We get back to where we're heading. And I just don't think that when this is all over, it's going to have a long-term effect on a jury. So I could be wrong. I just think people are going to go back to being who they are and just the other things going on in their lives are going to have a lot more to do with how they are as jurors than this. Yeah, I think so too. No, I mean, the idea that juries can be um, doing their work by Zoom is interesting to me. I mean, I think that's just from a uh, technology perspective, I just don't know that that can that can work. But yeah, uh, that really concerns me. Uh, I, I'm a big Zoom advocate. I could even see doing a bench trial by Zoom, but for a jury trial, the to try to get across all the nonverbal communication, to try to do the group formation, to try to to know whether or not you're getting through to somebody with all the nonverbal and visual cues you get, just the gut feel you get from <laughs> dealing with human beings are in the room. I, I don't think, I think we would be at a disadvantage. Right. Uh, and I say that, but then again, you I've seen online focus groups where jurors could give money without a problem at all. So I, I don't know how much of that's true. Uh, but I, 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 I do say that I would uh, not want to be one of the first, I'll, I'll be one of the first Zoom depots, one of the first Zoom hearings, I'll do Zoom mediations all day long. I would probably do a bench Zoom bench trial. I may do a Zoom, you know, dry breach of contract case or some of that. I would not want to do a personal injury jury trial by Zoom unless I saw other people do it successfully and was convinced there was data that my client would not be harmed. Right. I, I, I don't I don't I would not be an advocate for doing that. And look, this isn't gonna last forever. But you know, this is not enough. No, it's not. Hopefully this isn't going to last forever. <laughs> and that's actually the last thing I want to kind of bring up and what, before we wrap up, you know, different states are approaching things and different cities and counties are approaching things differently. You know, this episode is going to air May 1st. Right now we're it's actually April 22nd when we're recording. And, you know, already some states are opening up some. Uh, the state of Texas, I know where we are, has a task force to talk to give advice to the governor about how we're going to open up in phases. <laughs> I think what Georgia, Tennessee, and I think Florida are opening up some. So the question is, you know, as law firms, you know, we owe a duty to our clients to move our cases. We also have a duty to ourselves and our family. We have a duty to the people we work with uh, to not only prosper and so we can feed everybody, but also to keep everyone safe and healthy. 
So to what extent do we open back up? To what extent do we get back to normal, start working in offices, start doing in groups, start traveling, start being in person with people? Well, I think we have to keep ourselves safe and our families safe. Uh, the reality is that irrespective of what the governor says, uh, I probably, no, not probably, I know that I'm not sending my kid to summer camp this summer. Um, so in you, you've got to do what you've got to do to keep yourself, yourself and your family safe. And, you know, the scary thing is that there are folks out there who don't have the luxury of being uh, in a profession or in a, in a job that they can decide for themselves. I mean, they've got to go to work or they've got to uh, uh, show up in person if they're told to. Um, so, for ourselves, I can't control that, right? You know, I can't control the rest of the universe. I can control myself and we can control our firm and our staff. I think we need to do whatever we need to do to keep ourselves safe and our staff safe and their families safe. Yeah, I'm really looking at things. You know, if it, if it, if it looks like it's a political decision and not a fact-based decision when things are being opened back up. And, and I'm going to give Governor, you know, at least in Texas, Governor Abbott, the benefit of the doubt for right now, because I'm, you know, I've not agreed with a lot of his decisions when he was on the Supreme Court, you know, I, I've, but at the same time, in this situation, I, he seems to have been pretty responsible to me. Uh, 95% of the stuff he's done, I agree with. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to listen, but if I feel like they're saying, okay, everyone can go go back to work in person, and, and I don't feel it's safe based on medical stuff, mm-hmm. you know, I'm certainly not then going to do anything I think is going to put our people at risk. So, you know, even when we do it, you know, I think we're probably going to do this in phases. And so, you know, I I can see them going, you can have up to 10 people in a place, but they got to be six feet apart. Well, you know, we have 32 employees at our firm and we have people in cubicles. We, you know, to the extent that we want to start allowing some people to come back in person, we don't necessarily have everybody come back or not everyone come back the same days of the week, you know? And I think that, uh, we need to be very cognizant of some of our employees and, and we want to make a way where they don't have to reveal their personal health information to the world. But some of our uh, people may have some underlying health conditions and make them more susceptible. And I definitely want to give them, even as we start reopening in the months or weeks to come, give them the flexibility to, if you're more at risk, uh, of dying, if you catch this, then maybe you can self quarantine and we'll let you work from home longer. Um, what I think is so frustrating is that there is no um, consensus, right? Even the uh, experts are disagreeing, and you don't know where to go for the right answer. So it is uncertain. And so when things are uncertain, I think that you know what you're saying is accurate. We got to take you know, look at the scientific data that we can find and make um, assessments based on what we see and what we think is safe for our staff. And I mean, I think that we're going to err on the side of, you know, being overly cautious. Yeah. Um, I, I think we, we sue companies for not taking adequate safety measures for putting profits before people. I think we have to hold ourselves to the same standard that we hold defense defendants to if not, then we're just hypocrites that are in it for the money and we're not, we're not real. That's a, that's a great point. I think that's a great point. And um, we can't fall into that idea that um, we're going to start looking at profits before people. Um, that's what our, you know, our litigation firm and, and our, our strategies are built on. But that being said, I, I pray that this, you know, gets to the point. I, I, I miss seeing you in person. I'm missing other friends, coworkers, family in, in person. And, uh, you know, while we're going to keep moving and keep the wheels of justice grinding, I, I also am really looking forward to the day that we can uh, meet up in person again. I bought a pair of high heels and, you know, (laughs) they should be arriving tomorrow. And even though I have no intention of wearing them around my house, I'm hopeful that I'll be in the office soon. Well, I am hopeful about that, too. I I promise not to wear high heels, (laughs) maybe a pair of boots or something. (laughs) Okay. well, thank you so much, Sonia. Um, 
And I hope you all join us again uh, on our next episode. Our next episode is Nick Rowley. You don't want to miss it on Trial Lawyer Nation. Thank you for joining us on Trial Lawyer Nation. I hope you enjoyed our show. If you're listening to this episode on a mobile device, please click on ratings and review and leave our show a five-star rating and write a review. And if you're listening to this episode from our website, please leave a five-star rating on the episode page. We'd love to reach more listeners, and doing this will help more attorneys find this podcast. You can also visit our website at www.triallawyernation.com to opt into our mailing list so you can stay updated on our new episodes. I promise we won't spam you. And thanks to your feedback, we've improved our podcast website. There's now a resources tab that you can click that shows you all the books we've mentioned on our podcast. If you have a Facebook account, please send us a request to join a private group called Trial Lawyer Nation Insider Circle. This exclusive group will allow you to hear about our guests before an episode airs, interact with the show, and get a sneak peek at some of the behind the scenes moments. I love to hear from all of you, and our Table Talk episodes are based solely on questions from our fans. So please continue to send us emails at podcast at triallawyernation.com. Thanks for tuning in, and I look forward to having you with us next time on Trial Lawyer Nation. Each year, the law firm of Cowan Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide on trucking and company vehicle cases. If you have a case involving death or catastrophic injuries and would like to partner with our firm, please contact us. We have experience finding potential defendants that other firms miss, and we've added millions of dollars to cases by finding these sources of recovery. If you have a catastrophic injury or death case where the policy limits appear to be insufficient, give us a call. If we can find another defendant, we can partner on the case. And if we can't, then we won't ask for any of the fees. You can reach Delacy Friday by calling 210-941-1301 or send an email to podcast at triallawyernation.com. She will coordinate a time for Michael Cowan to speak with you in person or by phone to discuss the case in detail. This podcast has been hosted by Michael Cowan and is not intended to, nor does it create the attorney-client privilege between our hosts, guests, or contributors and any listener for any reason. Content from the podcast is not to be interpreted as legal advice. All thoughts and opinions expressed herein are only those from which they came.